Welcome, everybody. We'll take just a minute for um, everyone to get logged on, and then we will get started. Alrighty. Welcome everyone to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is biodiversity, early warning systems, and what they can teach us for public policy and planning with Phoebe Bernard. Welcome, Phoebe. Thank you so much, Riley. It's um, a treat to be here. I'm sorry that it took us a while to make the connection work properly, but all here now, and I'm happy to welcome everybody else who's here. Uh, thank you for joining. I'm sure for most of you it's evening. For me here in the Pacific Northwest, it's still late afternoon, mid late afternoon. Yeah, thanks so much. And it worked seamlessly. Um, my name is Riley Davenport, and I'm an educator and raptor specialist at Hawk Mountain. And we're so glad that you're all joining us today. Um, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. We continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. And Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit, and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, thank you for your continued support. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone has been remaining healthy and safe during um, these times of COVID challenges. And we're excited to offer our local and global community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone's aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will be accessible on our YouTube channel as a continued resource. And we also have a link on our website directly um, connecting you to our YouTube channel if you're interested. At any time today uh, during the program, you may submit questions down at the bottom of the screen where it says Q&A feature. And we've designated some time at the end of the program uh, to answer some questions. So we're so excited that Phoebe's joining us today. When working in Southern Africa, Phoebe led the development of integrated systems in that region for biodiversity, including taxa on land, in oceans and freshwater and gathering data on populations, range changes, and phenology changes to life cycles. Before we get started, I also would like to share some of Phoebe's background information with our audience. So Phoebe founded and led Namibia's first national biodiversity and climate change programs, started South Africa's Biodiversity Futures Program, and was lead climate vulnerability scientist there before returning to the US in 2017 to run the Pacific Biodiversity Institute. She's now an affiliate full professor at the University of Washington, CEO of the Stable Planet Alliance, film co-producer at Transmedia Vision USA, and affiliate of the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology at the University of Cape Town. So enough for me, Phoebe, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I'm gonna um, be here, but I'll just mute myself and turn off my video um, and you can share your screen and get started. Great, thank you so much, Riley. And I really appreciate your back end um, help with all of this. Everybody, I'm going to share my screen in, in a second, but actually what I wanted to say is a lot of that probably sounds <laughs> really dull, but um, I, I jumped at the opportunity to speak to this community because I had been an intern at Hawk Mountain in 1982. <laughs> you probably can't believe that with this white hair, um, it's the internship program has actually been running that long. But I was a spring intern then to help with the spring migration with uh, American kestrel and barn owl research and with um, raptor rehab. So it's a real pleasure to come back and speak to you all. If everybody is sitting comfortably, <laughs> then I will begin. And I wanna to speak to you about stuff that for me is quite a lively topic. Um, and I'll try to make it lively, even though you heard the words public policy and things like that, which make some people go to sleep. 
Um, I think most of us will recognize this beautiful view. If you haven't been up to the North Lookout at Hawk Mountain, then you will have one of the most lovely views in the whole world. And as we settle into this talk, I wanted to keep first and foremost, some of the things that we really know and love and guard most carefully that, um, you know, everything that we know and love increasingly is at stake in these times. So if you aren't a member of Hawk Mountain, please become one. <laughs> the Alleghenies and the Appalachian Mountains, like mountains all around the world, many of which I've been fortunate to work in, are exceptional places to get a little bit more of a bird's eye view in what is happening on onto what is happening with our planet. And I thought I'd start out just to remind us of how beautiful it all is, how exquisite the colors are, the rarefied air, the beauty of the seemingly timeless pace of bird migration as birds make their way from their breeding grounds to their overwintering grounds and back again. And so that forms the backdrop of what I'd like to speak about today. I won't speak long. I don't want to make it in, uh, I don't want to make it a formal talk with just questions at the end. I would love to engage you all in conversation, but um, I'll, I'll run through a few slides and then we can talk. So on my side of the country, we've got some pretty spectacular volcanic mountains. I'm living between Seattle and Vancouver, Washington, no, Vancouver, BC, although there is also a Vancouver, Washington, which is confusing. And this is my little backyard volcano, Mount Baker. The Cascade Range also has great beauty, altitudinal range, of course, and a complex of different habitats around it, mountain lakes, alpine style tundra, um, a, a tree line, heathlands, and uh, beautiful high montane woodlands, which are really responding to global environmental change, including climate change, land use change, the invasion of alien species, and so on. But like Hawk Mountain and its surroundings in the valley, the valleys that are around uh, most of Pennsylvania and, and the Appalachian region, we have a lot of changes happening in the valleys. We have a lot of changes even affecting the high mountains. So with that context, this is what I'd like to talk about today. But Bearing in mind the view that one can get of the valley as you sit on North Lookout. And this is, of course, the view pretty much the same that I had in 1982 when I lived down in the valley with a wonderful family, farming family. A lot of changes are happening. How can we track them best? And how can we use our volunteer energy and initiative to really make things happen that can inform the way thing, decisions are taken, the public policies, the strategies, the management regimes that we can have. So just to change pace, okay, here we are in 2022, and we are undergoing, as we all know, the perfect storm of uh, challenges, threats, and um, increasingly dizzyingly uh, paced change for the species and ecosystems that we live in. Not only do we have stronger and more fierce hurricanes, they're often really uh, piling up on each other as we all know from the past few years. Again, in many parts of the country, certainly out where I'm living now, Fire is increasing in severity, intensity, frequency, seasonality. All of these things are really posing enormous threats for our species and ecosystems. And of course, for human settlements where we are building 
human settlements in places where they probably shouldn't be. And we're maybe introducing species into our own gardens and playing fields and roadside verges, which are highly flammable. So I wanted to talk about this concept of early warning systems. And I wanted to kind of tongue in cheek propose some of the work that I will tell you about that I was involved with in Southern Africa over 34 years um, for not only my region out here in the Pacific Northwest, the Cascadia region, but maybe for Appalachia too. So yes, as Riley said, I'm Phoebe Barnard. I'm a professor at the University of Washington, but affiliate, my day job is that I run a new global uh, coalition called the Stable Planet Alliance of a number of organizations and people incredibly dynamic and committed to keeping our planet stable, keeping our climate stable, and therefore keeping our society stable. So some of the questions that I want to talk about in this, in, you know, in this next half hour, things are changing. What do we know? What don't we really know? And how do we know? And how sure are we of that change? And then what can we do about it? Sometimes uh, we all know that, uh, for example, some warblers are becoming increasingly rare and in danger of becoming extinct, certainly locally extinct. So having a good handle on what's happening and uh, being able to put in place conservation measures is obviously an important thing that we can do as those deeply concerned about and in love with the natural world. Just a little bit about my journey. <laughs> These are all my institutions over the last uh, probably decade or perhaps 15 years. Um, and starting with the, the, my life as an ornithologist where I still worked uh, on birds at the Fitzpatrick Institute that Raleigh um, mentioned, the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology at the University of Cape Town, and um, on and on. So I won't dwell on that. This is one of the few graphs I'll show. And it's a, a graph some of you may have seen, I don't know, from a big global assessment about 15 years ago of the status and trends of the world's ecosystems and the things that were threatening them. Um, and it was the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. You may have, <laughs> some of the older ones of you may have heard of it. And on the top, of course, are a lot of the things that are driving the loss of species, the degradation of ecosystems. And on the left are obviously those, the, the biomes, the major biomes or, or large areas of multiple ecosystems on the left. And I really just wanted to point out that where you see arrows going straight up, this is an indicator, it's a summary graph of some of the work that was done by literally thousands of scientists and economists and uh, public health scientists around the world for this process, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And where the, where the arrows are pointing up, that's where the trends are so severe that we absolutely need to be carefully monitoring them and very carefully acting to protect not only ourselves, but other species from them. So climate change and nutrient pollution, especially from agriculture, are, not to most people's surprise, the most significant changes. Hmm. Okay, I have a problem for a second. I'm going to stop sharing and then I'll start sharing again because my computer freezes sometimes and... So I'll get back to that in a second. Hold on. Okay, sorry, where were we? <laughs> 
So we know the world is changing. What does this mean for the species around us? We, we know at Hawk Mountain a great deal about birds of prey. We're counting them. We know when they migrate, how high they migrate, the extent to which they migrate in numbers or solitarily. But think of all the things that we don't know so much about that are fundamental to the functioning of our ecosystems. Small warblers, salamanders, insects of different kinds, bark beetles, for example, spiders, um, mycelia, the fungi that connect the, the forests in the kind of internet of the forest, etc. Oh dear. <laughs> Sorry, Riley, I'm going to have to try something else. Okay, I think now I can view another sort of arrow that I can use. So biodiversity early warning systems are a concept that we pioneered in Southern Africa. And I'll talk a little bit about them, of course, but these are the fundamental questions they're asking. What's happening to species? What are the patterns in space and time? What is happening at a small scale versus at a regional scale or a national or global scale? What's the range of possibilities of what might be happening to species that appear to be declining or appear to be spreading? When I was at Hawk Mountain, for example, in 1982, it was the first time I'd ever seen turkey vultures. I grew up in Massachusetts. They didn't occur there. I'd never seen them. But now they're all over the place and far into Canada. So what is the range of possibilities for species that are declining or spreading? And how do we know what's the data that are there to demonstrate this? Many of us can have memories like the one that I just mentioned of my own experience with turkey vultures, but how many of us actually keep detailed field notes in notebooks or on a computer that gives a specific location and a date, all of which are really important for generating the kind of information that we need to shape management, policy, and planning. And especially how confident are we about the things that we think we know? And then finally, you know, what's the appropriate management action that we need to take based on information? Those of you who have a, a background in science or an interest in science will understand this graph. Um, you know, the, the environment can be an unpredictable place and sometimes a highly variable place. So in the upper graph, we have a lot of different um, different observations of data. Now, I'm really just showing this doesn't really matter what's on the x-axis, what's on the y-axis, but um, in, in this case, it's uh, about rodents and uh, temperature. And in some places, there are very strong correlations and it's a very predictable pattern. But in other cases, it's really hard to figure out what the trend is. And so that's where statistics come in. And you may feel that statistics um, are unreliable. And I used to, too, until I started working with statisticians that actually also were ecologists. And the more I started to learn about them, the more I realized what a powerful tool they are for stuff like this. So when I came back to the States in 2017, after decades, I decided to set about helping agencies out here in the Pacific Northwest build an early warning system for biodiversity because I could see that um, you know fish and wildlife departments and parks departments and the departments of natural resources they were all doing their own thing there was limited collaboration and if you asked them about what they knew about species they would know a few things about species that got hunted or species that had some other kind of economic value like timber trees, um, or, or even increasingly recently, they might know a few things about species that had cultural value to First Nations and tribes, but very, very little about anything else. And I was quite taken aback. 
I grew up in this country, but um, we knew a lot more about species in Africa than it seemed that people knew about in this country, which I thought was very sad. So I got a process together with all these agencies and universities and others asking, how can we change this? How do we set up an early warning system that you know is efficient and helps deliver the kind of information that the governor might need or a, a landowner might need, or even just a, the director of an agency without you know re, recreating the wheel? And, you know, do the existing data platforms that we have um, work to help cope with this data uh, that might be collected by citizen scientists and uh, agency officials and so on or not? I want to apologize for the kind of um, animation of PowerPoint. I'm not a person that likes PowerPoint animations, but I grew up still when I was a little kid in the age of carousel slideshows. And so I think that for me, it helps me shift on to the main uh, topic of the next slide a little better. So in a second, we'll talk about what early warning systems are and what they do. Um, and I think I'll just go on to that now. Now, many of you will know that we have had uh, really scary and, and destructive and fatal tsunamis uh, in recent years. The, if you were old enough to remember the 2011 Boxing Day tsunami that happened in the, uh, in the Indian Ocean, sorry, then you will know how devastating they can be. So, you know, for a range of reasons for public health disease outbreaks, um, economic shocks, uh, natural disasters like tsunamis, there are all kinds of early warning systems. And basically the principle is that data get detected by some sensor. It may be a human with binoculars or it may be a surface buoy such as the tsunami early warning system. And the data get transferred to a central place and then somebody acts on it. That's the basic principle. But how do we do this for biodiversity? And why on earth do we not even already for a long time have such early warning systems when the result of the lack of such things can mean that species get snuffed out and go extinct locally? And that's about as final as it gets. You can rebuild after a tsunami or uh, you, you can pick up your life, as we all know, after COVID, for many of us anyway. Um, but for species extinction, it's, it's a completely different matter. And I'll talk about the systems that we do have in a second. But basically, you know, military uh, and other users of information that are concerned about risk have early warning systems. So why don't we have these in conservation? And they can be at different scales. So, you know, when I was a young married woman, I went off to take a job in Zimbabwe with Oxford University for a PhD, and it didn't quite work out, but just to cut a long story short, three years, for that project turned into 34 years. And during that time, I was profoundly privileged to be able to work in science and in public policy for two governments, especially the government of Namibia down on the sort of almost bottom left and, um, and South Africa at the far Southern tip of the continent. And of course, I did a lot of work across the continent and had a lot of work mentoring students and young colleagues, uh, especially women across the continent. But I was mainly, um, my day job was working in uh, government funded um, environmental protection agencies or government funded research institutes. And it was pretty lovely situation I realized later because unlike the US and many older countries, 
Um, Namibia and South Africa were examples of countries that were at real crossroads of their history. Um, Namibia was just getting its independence from South Africa as a colonial power when I moved there. And before that, it had been run by Britain and, and Germany. But uh, so now it was independent and it was like wiping the slate clean. And so they were able to say, now, what do we want to do from here? What kind of society do we want? And how are we going to get there from here? And then to put in place programs and policies and practices that would give rise to the constitution and make that all happen. So that's what I was doing. And it was a real privilege to do that because you don't often get the chance to really influence things fairly profoundly, even if it's just in a certain place for a certain amount of time. Many of us don't ever have that chance and I was lucky enough to have it. So Namibia is a very arid country. Some of you may have been privileged to visit. I was so lucky to live there for 14 years and work for the government and the university in that time. And so looking at it from on high, you can see that much of the West Coast is a deep, uh, very, very dry desert, the Namib. But it, Namibia was just getting its independence, as I said, and it was a really exciting, um, inspiring time to be there. It had a constitution that specifically protected not only biodiversity, but ecosystems and ecosystem processes for the benefit of all Namibians. Now, how cool is that? The USA certainly doesn't have that, and we need to have it. It also protected sustainable use of resources. So how do we know that things are sustainable? Well, that's why I got involved in the work that I did. And I was also, uh, so I set up in uh, RAN for a decade, Namibia's first biodiversity program, but I also at the same time set up a national climate change program and ran that for a year and then we hired someone else. So Namibia undertook these kind of visioning exercises for the country as a whole you know, where did it want to be in 2010, 2020, 2030? And it was a small place with less than 2 million people, but a very progressively minded country. So there were lots of good things that came out of there. Then I moved to South Africa and I took a job in the National um, Biodiversity Institute, which was government funded, um, looking at the similar kinds of things. What was happening to species in space and time under climate change? Especially South Africa is a really deeply democratic country. People are vocal, they'll get up and talk, they don't take no for an answer. Um, it's really a country where the progressive move away from the terrible years of apartheid that had preceded South Africa's democratic transition in 1994, um, all of that basically also gave rise to a country that could ask, okay, now what do we want to do? Now we're in charge at long last. How do we want to run our society? A huge privilege to be part of those kinds of things. So I was at this National Biodiversity Institute. It was based right at the base of Table Mountain, one of the most beautiful mountains in the world, at the center of a global biodiversity hotspot. And there was a lot of progressive work that was done at that institute that I won't go into now, but it was, you know, I guess the reason I wanted to show you is that a lot of people have really outdated ideas about what goes on in Africa. They think that they're very backward countries or that, you know, there's very little literacy or that people live in huts. On the contrary, these were world leading people that I was lucky to work with. And we were doing some pretty cutting edge stuff at these institutes. So geospatial data, national biodiversity assessments, um, and a national protected areas expansion strategy. 
You don't hear that much in this country. And South Africa also had an, a bunch of other important public works programs that were uh, really helpful for uh, dealing with invasive species. This one called Working for Water was removing woody invasive species that had been introduced from mainly Australia, but a few other countries that were choking out um, catchments, uh, watersheds, and um, employing a lot of people as a big public works program. So, you know, this meant that there was a lot of change in the landscape. Areas that had been planted in the 1950s and 60s by the apartheid government um, with alien timber trees uh, for, you know, companies' profits, those were removed so that the land could come back to its own, that the watersheds could re recover from all the, the water being sucked up by these trees, and that people could earn it a gainful, they, they could be gainfully employed and get childcare and other kinds of things. So there were some pretty progressive um, programs here that were very effective. They were sometimes better on paper than they were in practice, but they learned a lot as they went on and they're world famous programs now. So against the backdrop of these things, I felt it was really important to put together an integrated system with biodiversity data that people could gather. Now, citizen science is a somewhat big thing in the US. It's extremely big in countries like the UK. It's surprisingly big in several countries in Africa, especially Nigeria, Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe, and a couple of others. And we wanted to put together a situation where we could understand what was happening with diverse species in the marine environment, the coastal and wetland environments, and terrestrial environments. And how they were faring against things like fire or invasive species encroachment, or just climate change. And land use change, especially with things like suburban development, golf courses, all kinds of stuff like that. And part of the early warning system was set up to look at changes in phenology. Now, if you don't know what phenology is, it's just timing, changes in the timing of species life cycle, whether it's the migration of butterflies or swallows or the um, molt of birds, like this Cape sugar bird that I'm holding there. It's a species that I worked on for a long time. Uh, or the, um, the shoaling of different kinds of fish uh, that people rely on for food. So all of that changes in phenology under climate change is really significant for understanding what may happen to ecosystems. So we were lucky to put together things in which uh, amateur divers could contribute information on coral reefs and fish and things like that, that um, bird watchers could contribute information on bird migration, but also on nesting and occurrence and distribution of birds. And then we had a whole bunch of insect people running around the landscape looking at termites and butterflies. And um, it was a really wonderful time. The secretary bird was kind of an iconic species. Secretary bird is one of the world's truly weird raptors that stands on long legs, stomps around the savanna looking for snakes. And when they find them, they'll kind of kick them until they're dead and then they'll swallow them. If you haven't seen a secretary bird, Google them, they are wonderful. And here's a map of the secretary bird. You'll see its name Serpentarius, meaning snake eater. This is the kind of data that we would get from one of the programs in the early warning system. It was called SABEP2 or the Southern African Bird Atlas Project number two. And this was basically just 
a comparison of what had happened from 1990 when the first bird atlas was done to nowadays and which species were becoming rarer as indicated by the orange, which were becoming locally extinct as indicated by the red in this map and which were moving into new areas a little bit as indicated by the green or which were completely new um, and had never been seen before in those grid cells indicated by blue. So this kind of data is what we could find just by having people who love to go bird watching out with binoculars all over the landscape, kind of gently, friendly, competing with each other to cover as much of the landscape as possible and tell what was there. And that gave government and us, because I was working in a government funded institution, but also landowners and nonprofits and so on, a lot of profoundly valuable information for economic policy, for land use planning and things like that. I probably don't want to go into this, but just notice that Early warning systems for biodiversity are kind of driven by the science policy community, um, planners and government directors and things, together with scientists and statisticians, design a process. Citizen scientists, but also some professionals, go and gather the data in four different forms, basically population data, spatial data like bird atlases that I just showed you with the secretary bird, time data like phenology, and then bio blitzes, if you've heard of bio blitzes, rapid assessment data. And they just get put into a mill and they spit out really useful information. So we were able to do quite a lot of this stuff in South Africa, especially, but also more broadly in Southern Africa, that I think has, has become a really good model. And it had its scientific side, we were able to produce some really high quality um, scientific papers from this information that a country like South Africa or Namibia um, wouldn't have been able to produce by funding government people to go and do that. So I guess to wrap this up, I just want to ask a question. What if Hawk Mountain and the universities and community colleges and a few other nonprofits in Pennsylvania might think about collaborating to do some of this work? There's a lot of relevant data sets already at Hawk Mountain and its partner organizations. And perhaps there are already initiatives along this line to sort of pull it all together. But in my experience, many organizations do their own thing. They have some data. It's not always really well integrated with state or county or national data or global data. Um, what if it were possible to gather information, even just for birds as a whole, that could feed into some of these other things. Now, many of you might know programs like eBird, um, a broad, now global, but especially North American program to, uh, from bird watchers and bird counters uh, to do some of this stuff. And that's really very important. And then combine it with all kinds of information on sort of the social and physical environment to help understand what's happening and how to change it. And I won't go into detail on this, we don't have time. But as we go into times of climate change, we're not the only ones that, we're not the only species obviously that's affected by climate change and by extreme weather events. How are these things happening uh, and af affecting other species? So in the Cascadia region, we built up a provisional system. They're just starting to get on with it now, but I'm in another job now. But um, basically putting all these elements together and making it work. 
And a bioregion like the Appalachian Mountains seems to me, um, partly because we know that species move towards the poles and they move uphill, mountains are very good for detecting changes. These were some of the partner organizations that we were working with um, as we started to set up this Cascadia Biodiversity Early Warning System. Trees are another group of species often um, dealt with in atlasing. And in Namibia, we had a Namibia tree atlas. I should have thought to wear my t-shirt. <laughs> it's a beautifully designed t-shirt, the Namibian tree atlas. And um, so some of you may be involved in citizen science projects, I hope so. But the, the, the earth is calling out to all of us. And we need to be there watching and listening. And increasingly, so few people are. So those of you who have you know, been involved with Hawk Mountain or have been interested enough to come to this talk um, are, are those who love nature and are already listening. What I found cool about the Southern African early warning systems is that it brought in a lot of people that wouldn't have ordinarily done this because one or two people in a community would be really keen on it. And they would challenge their friends, their family, their faith communities to get involved. Climate Watch is an um, Australian program that was absolutely fantastic. I'm not even sure whether it's still as active now as it was a few years ago, but I would urge you to go Google it if you haven't already uh, known of it. And in the discussion, I'd love to talk about some of the, you know, experiences that you've all had with citizen science, whether any of you are involved in these kinds of programs um, from a management point of view. But just to finish, I'd like to say that bird, books like this, the Red Data Book for Birds of South Africa, Lesotho and Swaziland, that was one of the key users of information data from SABAP2, the Southern African Bird Atlas program that I mentioned with the Secretary Bird. And I was really happy to see not only uh, conservation information using this data, but land use planning data, uh, climate change resilience planning data, because South Africa is way ahead of, um, of this country on many, many things on that line. And it was a really very, very um, satisfying thing to be in on. So I would just like to, I guess, remind you of the many, many things that need biodiversity data that we often don't have in this country and see whether, as we've done in my region, this is Cascadia, uh, between Vancouver and Portland, basically, whether we can't get something like this going in other regions around the country and put together something that can deliver demonstrable results, starting small, building upwards, a lead organization, leading or co-leading a coalition of other partners and delivering information that helps us figure out how to navigate the future. So just to remember, we are incredibly privileged to live on this earth. Don't ever forget that. In all the time that we spend on cell phones or driving or shopping, our fundamental roots are here. We need to understand it, we need to listen to it, we need to protect it, and we need ways of being able to do that knowledgeably so we can make the right choices. So thank you very much for listening. Here's my email address. Look forward to talking with you. Thank you so much, Phoebe. That was wonderful. And getting to hear just your experiences and your impacts, like spreading to different countries and hearing 
how other countries are kind of, uh, you know, working with the changing climate is, is really interesting. So thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask Phoebe, you can go ahead and post it in the Q&A um, feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'd be happy to answer those for you. Um, in the meantime, though, I did want to ask you, um, and I know we were chatting about it the other day, um, from your experience of being an intern at Hawk Mountain in 1982, was it? <laughs> yes, it sounds so long ago. <laughs> history now. Um, I wanted to know, like, what part of, um, like, your journey that was for you? Was it something that you were just, you know, starting out and that was a catalyst to what you are doing now? Um, or I'm, I'm just curious what part of your journey um, you were in when you were here with us. It was a beautiful interlude for me, and it was life-changing um, in so many respects. I was already working on Raptors. Uh, I had moved from Massachusetts off to Nova Scotia to study at Acadia University, and I started working on Northern Harriers then, and ended up marrying uh, my colleague who was also working on Northern Harriers and then became kind of the world expert for quite a long time on the Harrier group around the world. And together we ended up working on Harriers in, in Southern Africa too. But I was always more um, broadly interested in ecosystems and bigger picture questions. So I let him do that. And I started developing, you know, broader programs for countries and things. But at Hawk Mountain, I was able to work with Seth Benz, who was there at the time. He, he lived in the cottage on the mountain. Uh, and he was undertaking the, um, the, the studies at the time on barn owls and American kestrels. And so I could basically tag along with him and be his assistant. And it was a really productive time, actually. I managed to publish a book chapter on the work that I did on American kestrels, even though it was really piddly stuff. Uh, somehow it got into a book chapter. And I was working on the contamination by fecal material that kestrels would have of their eggs in nest boxes. And uh, also helped Seth with a lot of the barn owl stuff. And to this day, I absolutely love owls and now I live in a beautiful little cedar grove in Washington state where we have barred owls and so every time I see barred owls come through and there's a female that roosts in our garden a lot of the time I think of the barred owl that I raised and rehabilitated at Hawk Mountain that had been brought in as a youngster with a after a automobile accident so I'm always reminded of, of Hawk Mountain. And it was a transformative time because it helped me really kind of ground myself in what I wanted to do. That's and wonderful. now we've got a, a, another intern living near me, Ursula Valdez, who's also a professor at the University of Washington. She's Peruvian by background, but she lives here now. And it's just been great to sit and at her about uh, Hawk Mountain when we get together. Wonderful. Um, I, that's, I really love that. And, you know, um, I, I just think that's great. And we have a lot of, uh, uh, current Hawk Mountain trainees that I see their names here in the, um, attendees that are viewing the program today. And I hope that maybe they can see that as inspiration to take it, their experience and, you know, look at the bigger picture as they move forward in their life and their career. So wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I see my friend Tom Kerr is here. And yeah. Thank you, Tom, for coming. I've been frustrated not to be able to see who is there because I'm used to, you know, normal Zoom meetings where everybody can be viewed in a gallery. So I didn't know until now that you were here. Thank you for coming. And thank you, everybody, for coming. But it's lovely to think back in those times where we used to talk together, Tom. Wonderful. Thanks so much for um, sending out a message, Tom. And um, Phoebe, I wanted to thank you so much for such a wonderful program. 
Um, and if anyone has any further questions for um, Phoebe, actually Phoebe in the chat, or I don't know if it's easier to post from your screen again, um, your email address, if anyone has any questions for you. Sure, I can put that back up again. Perfect. Um, and I should, can you see that? Whoops, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> um, I have a super touch, uh, super sensitive touch screen. Um, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, good. I There is a website for the Cascadia Biodiversity Early Warning System, but I won't try and show it now. If anyone's interested, you're more than welcome to write to me and I'll be happy to, to set it up. But as I say, uh, well, any of you who have worked in government will know that governments can be really slow. Government agencies that aren't used to collaborating can just take three years figuring out how to talk to each other before they do anything. So mm -hmm. by the time this started to get going, I'd been offered another job that I couldn't resist. So I ended up stepping away from this, which was frustrating because it's a lifelong love for me. But mm -hmm. uh, I would love to see uh, integrated programs for tracking species in space and time developed in other parts of this beautiful continent that we all live on. Mm -hmm. Well, Phoebe, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, if, like I said, if you have any questions for Phoebe, you can go ahead and email her at the address listed above. Um, but I wanted to thank you guys once again for joining us. And I hope Phoebe and everyone else has a wonderful night. Thanks so much, everyone. It's great to be with you, even if <laughs> even if separated on the screen. Thanks so much, Riley. Thanks, Cheers, Tom. Cheers, everyone. Bye.